Four diagrams. Four diagrams show how many electrons appear in each electron shell around an atom. For the first 20 elements, the maximum number of electrons in the first shell is 2, in the second shell is 8, and in the third shell is 8. This Bohr diagram of aluminum has 2 electrons in the first shell, 8 electrons in the second shell, but only 3 electrons in the third shell. The third outermost shell is not full. Electrons in the outermost shell are called valence electrons. And the outermost shell itself is called the valence shell. Boron has two electrons in its outermost shell. And since it's, uh, the second shell can hold eight electrons, uh, this shell, the outermost shell of boron, is not full. Silicon has four valence electrons in its outermost shell. And antimony has five electrons in its outermost shell. Which element is this? It has an atomic number of 18, which should mean that it has 18 electrons. If we count them up, that's so. First shell, there are two. Second shell, there are eight. And in the third shell, there are also eight. Therefore, there are 18 electrons. It has three electron shells, so you would find it in period three. And it has eight electrons in its outer shell, which puts it right here. And it means that this element is argon. Patterns of electron arrangement in periods and groups. There's a maximum of two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second shell, and eight in the third shell. Notice that the only elements with a full outer shell are noble gases. They are very stable. All atoms are unstable unless they have eight electrons in their outermost shell. So they attempt to gain or lose electrons to have a full outer shell. The arrangement of eight electrons in the outermost shell is called a stable octet. Atoms tend to gain, lose, or share one or more of their valence electrons to achieve a filled outer electron shell. Forming ionic compounds. Ionic bonds form when metals lend electrons to nonmetals. It's important to know and understand Bohr models so that you can understand this type of bonding. Ionic bonds form when metals lend electrons to nonmetals. So when two atoms get close together, their valence electrons interact. If the valence electrons can combine to form a low energy bond, a compound is formed. Each atom in the compound attempts to have the same stable number of valence electrons as the nearest noble gas. Sodium is unstable. It needs eight electrons in its outer shell. It has one. Chlorine is also unstable. It also needs eight electrons in its outer shell, and it has seven out of eight. If we look closely, we'll see that sodium is nowhere near having eight electrons in its outer shell, and it's unlikely that it's going to gain seven more electrons. So the easiest thing for it to do is to lose an electron from its outer shell, and therefore its outer shell becomes the second shell, which is already filled with eight electrons. If it loses its electron to chlorine, chlorine will also have a stable octet because it will gain one more electron, bringing the number of electrons in its outer shell to eight. So they'll both end up with eight electrons in their outer shell. It's just that with sodium, the outer shell is now the second shell. With chlorine, the outer shell is the third shell, and it's gained an electron from sodium. The end result is that sodium ends up with one less negative charge than positive charge. Because if you remember, the nucleus has in it protons or positive charges. Sodium has the same number of protons as electrons, just like all neutral atoms. But if it loses this electron to chlorine, it's going to have one more positive charge than negative charge. And this gives it a net positive charge. Chlorine, on the other hand, is going to gain an extra negative charge. This means it's going to have 
one more negative charge than it has positive charges in its nucleus. This gives it a net negative charge. Both of these result in stable ions. And when a positive ion is near a negative ion, they actually attract each other and form what is called an ionic bond. So sodium and chlorine are ionically bonded. Ionic bonding takes place between a metal, in this case sodium, and a nonmetal, in this case chlorine. Ionic bonds form when metals lose electrons and nonmetals gain electrons. Electrons are transferred. Forming covalent compounds. Covalent bonds form when two nonmetals share electrons. Covalent bonds form when two nonmetals share electrons. And this occurs because the electrons are shared between atoms so that each atom thinks it has a full outer shell. In this case, oxygen has six valence electrons, but it needs to have two more to form a stable octet. Hydrogen has one electron shown in green. This hydrogen here has one electron shown in green. Uh, but in order to have a full shell, it needs two electrons. You should remember that the first shell of each one of these atoms is full with only two electrons. So what hydrogen and oxygen end up doing is they share their electrons. And um, oxygen will share one electron with each hydrogen atom so that each hydrogen atom believes it has two electrons. And because hydrogen is sharing its lone electron, each one of these hydrogen atoms is sharing its lone electron with oxygen, the oxygen believes it has eight electrons in its outermost shell. This forms a very strong bond called a covalent bond. Here are some examples of covalent compounds. Water made of hydrogen and oxygen, ammonia made of nitrogen and hydrogen, carbon made of carbon and oxygen, and methane made of carbon and hydrogen. Watch the animation that compares ionic and covalent bonding. It takes about two minutes. Here are some testers for you. Covalent or ionic? Lithium combines with oxygen and electrons are transferred from the cation to the anion and the result is lithium oxide. This is ionic. Electrons are being transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. Covalent or ionic? Hydrogen plus fluorine gives us some shared electrons and we result, the result is hydrogen fluoride. The electrons are shared. This is a covalent bond. Electrons are being shared between two nonmetals. Here are some exercises to help you to understand uh, these concepts a little bit better. Uh, of interest as well, just how small is an atom? It's kind of a neat little video. You probably enjoy it.